Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Acts, chapter 1. That will be our foundational text when we get into it this morning. Acts, chapter 1. And when we do get into it, we're going to begin reading at verse number 6. Okay, so Acts chapter 1, verse number 6. You can get that ready as we prepare to get into this message today. We have embarked on a journey in a series that we have entitled The Road to Power. As all of us have had an experience with church over the number of years that we had this experience, and some, the experience is deeper than others. Some of you may have grown up in church. Some of you may have been around some church. But there is one thing that has become clear no matter where you go, and that is that in a relationship with God, that there should be a degree of power that is different than everyday life that you experience out of the relationship that you have with God. One of the challenges that many believers have is not often experiencing this power in their lives, not often seeing this power at work in their lives. There are a number of reasons why that can happen. To be honest with you, there are some times where things look really bad, where God's power is moving, but because it looks really bad, you don't recognize it. That's a very real possibility. However, one of the things that we've been talking about as we've been talking about this power is that the reality of the power of the kingdom of God in relation to your life has a lot to do with the identity you have, and I'm talking about the identification you have with Christ. In fact, the very first passage of Scripture we read for this series, or at least in the second part of the series, is a passage that talks about how we died with Him and have been buried with Him. And the reality is that God identifies us with Christ the moment we begin to exercise faith in Christ. And there is a unification that the scriptures say that we have with Jesus. A unification, right? He, we died with him, we were crucified with him, we rose with him, we're seated with him. There is a unification that the scriptures say that we have, that the Bible says we have, and that unification is a biblical, spiritual, divine fact. Fact, meaning it's an objective truth. Doesn't matter how we feel about it, it's true nonetheless. Objective. Yet many of us don't experience, feel this unification even though it's an objective truth. The fact that whether or not we feel it, that's the subjective. You can have an objective truth and not feel it or experience it no matter how true it is. The fact that we are in Christ, the fact that we've been buried with him, we died with him, we've resurrected with him, that we're seated with him, the fact that that is the case is true whether we feel it or not. But if we don't feel it, it's not on Jesus' part. It's on us. But I want to share something with you that I haven't shared with you in these, in thus far in this series. See, there's a bridge between the objective and the subjective. There's a bridge between the actual facts of the kingdom of God and what you feel and experience. There is a bridge. And all you have to do is walk on that bridge. We call that bridge faith. How do we begin to experience these objective truths of God's word, this unification with Christ? How do we begin to experience these objective truths subjectively in our lives? How do we begin to feel and experience them? By faith. See, there has to be a degree of what the Bible says that you are willing to do regardless of what you feel. Oh, okay. 
There has to be a degree of what the Bible says that you will do, regardless of what you feel. We are unified with him. And then last week, we talked about not just unification, but participation. That this passage that we were just memorizing, this Galatians passage, that I'm crucified with Christ, yet I no longer live, but now Christ lives in me, that is also a fact. Christ lives on the inside of you. Now, whether or not you feel that, whether or not you experience that, that is also going to be a walk across the bridge. It's going to be the exercising of faith. Last week, I, I shared it with you in this way. I said, if you won't allow Jesus Christ to live through you when you're in your feelings, then you can't expect him to live through you when you lay hands on somebody and pray for healing. That the same degree of faith that you exercise when you need him to do you a favor is the same degree of faith you exercise when he needs you to do him a favor. That when Jesus commands you, and let's, let's be real about this, we, we don't need Jesus to show up in our bedroom in a great blinding light to say, because his word already says that. And so that when we know when we're in a place where we should be obedient to that word, that whether we feel like it or not, we allow him to live through us. What would be the one thing that would hinder that? You. But the fact of the matter is that the idea that you've died, see, you haven't understood that yet by faith. Right? Right? Because the passage says, I am cru I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet I no longer live, but Christ lives by faith in me. See, the idea is you have to be willing to die. You have to be willing to die to allow him to live through you. One of the things that we love about people around us. Some of this is uh, some of this is, is a struggle for us. Some of this we have to get past. But one of the things we love about people around us is when people are real. Yes. Yes. We like when people are real. Mm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I'm I'm um, How do I say this? Uh, I don't, I don't, well, the, the problem is, it's, it's not a matter of not being able to say it. It's a matter of identifying it correctly. I, I don't want to say I am a reformed hip-hop head because I don't know if that's, that's the, the, the right term. But I, I grew up in the hip-hop era. I remember songs. I remember hip-hop music from 1979, right? So, I, I, <laughs> I am deeply culturally invested. Uh, I don't feel the same about hip-hop today as I did back then. And so that's the challenge that I have. But, but as a result, you know, sometimes I watch some stuff on YouTube by some older hip-hop guys and stuff like that. And whenever you watch something with rap people, with folks who are engaged in the hip-hop community, one of the things you always hear is things like, real dude, he's a real dude. Now... That term, the way it's being used, does not necessarily include things that we would identify with Christ likeness. Do you, do you feel what I'm saying to you? But yet we enjoy real people. But here's what's interesting if my real doesn't look like Jesus, Should I then be fake? She said, no, 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 that's the wrong answer. If me being real, if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and me being real doesn't look like Jesus, I'm better off being fake. 
Because if fake looks like Jesus, I win. Uh, okay, I can't. I can't. Y'all are not with me this morning. Oh, help me, Lord Jesus. I think I might have to. <laughs> yeah. See, sometimes we're like, yeah, I'm real. But what your real is contradicts the scriptures. And if your real contradicts the scriptures, then what that means is you're allowing your real, which is really just a new way to talk about your old self, you're allowing that realness to keep you away from Christ-likeness. You need to let it go. See, there's some stuff that where we're real, we need to let that go. We need to let it go. Because it's different than, the, than Christ's expectation of us. We have to be at a place where we no longer live. I used to be real. <laughs> I'd rather say that. I used to be real in this way. <sighs> Christ lives in us and we have to let him live. And in order to let him live, we have to let go. We have to be willing to die so that he can live in and through us. I'm trying to show you the road to power. And the road to power includes recognizing that you died with him. And that you've buried with him. That you've been resurrected with him. That even you're seated with him. And it also it takes recognizing that he lives in you. And that you no longer live. And so you allow him to live through you. There are moments where you have to die to yourself in order for him to live through you. And that is not a one-time process. See, we read that passage of Scripture and we think the day we gave our lives to Jesus, we died enough. But you're faced with the decision of dying to yourself every single day. And you have to make that decision to intentionally die every single day in order for him to live through you. And it's at that moment that you begin to cross the bridge from the objective to the object to the subjective. It's where you begin to see the reality of God's kingdom come alive and be real and you can feel it in your life. Yes. Amen. Amen. Dying to yourself yes. daily. So I want to take you to this passage in Acts. Because, see, all of this stuff that I'm talking about, this road to power, all of this is a setup for something else. <laughs> it's all a setup for something else. In the book of Acts, right here, Acts chapter 1, verse number 6, it says this. Then they gathered around him. And asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I want you to understand something about this question. The disciples are asking Jesus this question because the Jews believed that the Messiah was someone who was going to come and who was, who was going to free them from the oppression and dominion of any and everyone who suppressed them, and at this time in history during Jesus' life, it is the Roman Empire. So their understanding of the Messiah was that he was going to be a warrior who would lead them in an uprising against the Roman Empire to restore the nation of Israel to the Hebrew people. And this is why the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests and the elders had such a difficult time believing in Jesus because he was preaching a kingdom from heaven and they were looking for a kingdom on earth. So it's logical as the disciples ask Jesus, so are you at this time going to restore? Because I, I need you to know where we are in history. Jesus has already been crucified, already spent three days in the tomb, has already been resurrected, and he has been hanging out with them after death. So they're like, oh, we're almost there. Are you at this time, Lord, going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus' answer is poignant. His answer is timeless. And his answer is very real, and I'm going to put it in today's terms so that you understand it. His answer was, 
That's not your business. Do, do you see? Do you, it's in the text. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He says, it's not for you to know. That is a very kind way of saying, that's not your business. That's not your business. Whew. That's not your business. Here's what's interesting about what he's saying here. Because, see, where the disciples were in this moment in this question is not unlike where many Christians are today trying to presume God's will around the thing and then vehemently trying to pursue this will, but the will they're trying to pursue is not really what God wants them to be doing. Do you guys remember um, last year we had a series uh, called The Tree of Life, and one of the things I was saying in that series is one of the places where we always have problems in human life is when human beings are trying to control things that only God is supposed to control. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So I want you to think about this for a moment. Doesn't, don't, don't the scriptures tell us that God is the one who decides who leads nations? Does everybody recognize? Just tell me if you recognize that. The scriptures say that God is the one who decides who leads nations, right? You got that? Okay. How many of you agree with that? Raise your hand. You know that the scriptures say that. Hallelujah. Most of you do. All right. The scriptures tell us that God is the one who decides who leads nations. God is the one who decides who's going to be president and who's not. So that means that if I work myself up into a religious fever pitch about who and who will not be president, that I am spending energy and time and emotion in vain in an area that's not even really my business because I cannot make a choice because the choice is God's. So if I get all involved in that and get invested in that and do it from a religious perspective, God wants this person. That might be true, but he don't need you to do it. You're literally just wasting your time. In fact, isn't it interesting? The scriptures only give us two commands around leadership, national leadership. Two commands. Pray for them, submit to them. Doesn't say oppose them or try to choose them. Can I, can I get an amen? Can I? Okay. Why? Because that's not our business. God's got that handled. So this, this, but this is exactly what the disciples are doing in this moment. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus says, that's not your business. So to ensure that they are clear, though, and are focused, he then gives them an indication of what is their business. Oh, that question you just asked, that's not your business. But what I'm about to share with you now, this is your business. And here's what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus, you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Ah, that's not your business. But here's what is your business. You're about to receive power. And you're going to receive this power so that you can be my witnesses. That's your business. Now, earlier I said that this truth was timeless. And it's timeless for a reason. It's timeless because it is true today as it was when it was spoken then. Jesus, what are you going to do about the nations? That's not your business. But I'll tell you what is your business. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, he's going to have power, bring power into your life so that you could be my witnesses. That has not changed. This is why it is a waste of time for Christians to get engaged in all kinds of activities, get themselves all worked up about things that have nothing to do with the salvation of souls. You are off focus 
engaged in business that is not actually yours. When Jesus makes very plain what our business is. This is one of the reasons why we're failing today. Because a number of believers are engaged in things that are not their business while keeping completely shut and locked down and oppressed in their lives. The one thing that is our business. Now, I want you to understand the value of these words because... As I, as I said to you, this is after Jesus has been crucified, after he had been in the tomb for three days, after he had been resurrected, after he had been hanging out with the disciples for 40 days. This is after all of that. In fact, these are the very last words that he says before he ascends into heaven to never be seen again in that human form. The last words words. And what's interesting is that in Jesus's ministry, he had talked about the Holy Spirit several times. He talked about the Holy Spirit and he would say, look, the Holy Spirit, he's going to be a revealer of truth to you. The Holy Spirit is going to be a helper for you. The Holy Spirit is going to be a comforter for you. The Holy Spirit is going to be a teacher for you. In fact, the Holy Spirit will even be one who reveals things to come. And in all of those instances, Jesus was talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you. But in this moment, he shifts. In this moment, it's not about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you. In this moment, he's talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit through you. So that the very last words he speaks before he leaves this earth in its human, in his human form, before that human form is never seen again, the very last words he gives are the instructions about the Holy Spirit's power coming on you to work through you to witness for him. Now, I want you to understand some things about this power that are important. And then I'm done. This is not even long. Two things. Number one, the power that he's talking about comes from the Greek word dunamis. It's spelled D-Y-N-A-M-I-S. It's spelled kind of like dynamic because that is the word we get dynamic from. Dunamis. And this power that Jesus is promising to be able to empower us to witness is a power that you can depend on in a moment when you need to witness. Now, see, one of the challenges that we have is we are afraid to witness. We are uncomfortable with witnessing. Sometimes we feel we don't know enough to witness. But what Jesus is saying here is you have power on the inside of you that when you need it, he will come. And begin to speak through you. See, this should alleviate some of the fear and some of the pressure. Because the pressure is not on you. The Holy Spirit in you is waiting. And he's ready. He's waiting for you to sit down with that loved one. He's waiting for you to make the opportunity for him to begin to speak. And help you bear witness to the gospel. Listen, remember what I told you, the bridge from the objective truth to subjective, you walk by faith. That means you won't know how true this is until you do it. You won't know until you put yourself into that position. When it's time to share the gospel with somebody. To where not only are you in that position, but you are depending on the Holy Spirit. Listen, this is the key. We're talking about being in that position and not depending on yourself. If you put yourself in that position, you're like, oh, I hope I know enough. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, see, I shouldn't have done that. Anyway, y'all don't know. I won't go into it. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. If you put yourself in that position and then you say to yourself, Jesus said there's power available here. And I believe that that power is going to move through me right now. He will. 
He will. You will walk away from that conversation thinking, how did I know all that? How did I do that? You'll walk away from that conversation going, oh my gosh, the Holy Spirit came through. Here's the second thing I want you to understand about this power, this dunamis. Um, Dunamis is the same word that's used to talk about this power that we see in miraculous moves of God. So this dunamis is the same word that's used to describe when we prophesy. Same power that's used when we speak in tongues. It's the same power that's used if we lay hands on somebody and pray for them to be healed and they're healed. It's the same power for those things. Now, see, this is something we have to be clear about and understand well. Because we, we live in a time right now where we, we like our Christian bubble. And so, <laughs> we often look for these moves of God that we can utilize them amongst the body, for the body, but not beyond the body. Oh. Okay. Let me say to you this way. Um, The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he was talking about uh, tongues and he was talking about prophecy. He was teaching the Corinthian church about this. Chapter 14, 1 Corinthians. And what he says is, he says, look, if you speak in tongues, you edify yourself, but yourself only because nobody understands what you're saying. Then he says, but if you prophesy, you edify the body, and that's good because everybody understands what you're saying. Now, he describes what this edification looks like. He says, when you edify the body, what you're doing is you're strengthening and encouraging and bringing comfort to the body of Christ. You with me? All right, I need to shift now to bring you to a place of understanding. Now, edifying, strengthening, encouraging, comforting. Um, There's a man by the name of Tom Brady, who many of you are familiar with. I don't get as many boos now as I did before he was on the books. Since he's come and won some championship and all that. So it's, it's good we're, we're, in, we're in agreement here about Tom. But Tom Brady is known for the way he edifies his body. Tom Brady is known for how he eats. He's known for having a very strict diet. Tom Brady has that strict diet so that he can keep his body strong. So that he knows in his mind emotionally that he can be encouraged by the fact that he knows he treats his body well. And so that he can have comfort, physical comfort, not have to deal with inflammation, not have to deal with stomach issues or headaches because he's been eating poorly. So he eats to edify his body for strength, encouragement, and comfort. However, we know that that is not the end. The real reason Tom Brady wants to keep his body strong and his mind encouraged and his body in comfort is so that he can play football and win some games. So hear me, Jesus said that power would come for the purpose of witnessing. So that means that the power even that comes for prophecy really in the end is all about witnessing, not just about prophecy. Oh, I see some of y'all, some of y'all not getting it. Some of y'all not getting it. See, the challenge is today, oh, Lord Jesus, mm. Okay, I, I do in this case, I have to say. So <laughs> the challenge today is that, see, we get wrapped up in things like, I'm prophet so-and-so. And I'm prophetess so-and-so. And we want to use this prophetic gift so that people see that the glory of the Lord is with us. And we want to use it in the church because we realize that the church will put us in a position because of our prophetic gift. But the prophecy is not just, a, or as a matter of fact, it's not at all for our glory. Not mine as a prophet or yours as the one who receives the prophecy, but rather about something else. And that something else is the salvation of souls. Let me make it more practical and more plain for you. I want to help you, especially those of you, if you have a prophetic gift and you're in the house this morning, I am about to increase the accuracy of your prophecy tenfold. Right now, understanding this, if you receive a prophetic word, let's say you have somebody who works with you, you receive a prophetic word that there's a guy who works with you who he's not faithful to his wife, 
and the Lord gives you the word. See, your job is to then go to this person in private and say, listen, um, the Lord gave me a word, and I need you to just work this out for yourself, but the Lord gave me this word, and I need to share it with you. The Lord says that you've been unfaithful to your wife, and you need to repent and change that. You need to submit your life to Jesus. This is part B. I need to label it. You need to submit your life to Jesus because ultimately God wants you to serve him in sharing the gospel. Now, I cannot speak to the accuracy of point A, but I can tell you point B is 100% right on all the time. That that prophetic word is not just simply about spooking somebody out. It's not just simply about being right. It's not just simply even about sharing this word that this person might change. But see, there has to be a totality to the message. And the reality is the power that God gives us, the supernatural abilities that we even experience are really all about being his witnesses to people. So we have to recognize that even when we're operating in the gifts of the spirit, we can't get our minds to say that just throwing out the gift is where it ends, there then has to be the next step, and the next step is always the reconciliation of men to God. It can't just be I share a prophecy, but I also have to be engaged in the condition and salvation of your soul. Because Jesus said that the power was for being a witness. Not just to be used in a moment and leaving that moment unfinished. This is where I close. Over these past few weeks, what we've been talking about is this road to power. We've been talking about this power that is available to you. We've been talking about the fact that not only is it available to help you walk in victory, since you've died to sin, you no longer need to live in it. You do have to wrap yourself, wrap your mind around the fact that you've died to it, though. And not only that, as you've died with him and you've been resurrected with him and are even seated with him, recognize that those things are merely a byproduct of the participation that he lives in you, that he lives in you, that God lives in you, and that you can experience this God living in you if you allow him to live through you. But how can you have God living in you? but not have power. See, Jesus said when the Holy Spirit would come upon you, that there would be power. But not just power for any old thing. And not just power just for power's sake, but power for the express purpose of being a witness for Jesus. That you no longer have to be afraid about sharing your faith. Because in that moment, the Holy Spirit will come. He will begin to speak. He will begin to bring things to mind. That even if you have a prophetic gift, maybe you have dreams, maybe you have words of knowledge, words of wisdom, maybe the Lord speaks to you in, in particular ways about people, that even when you have that kind of a gift, that really the gift itself is really all about the salvation of souls. Please hear me. All of the miracles that Jesus did, he did simply so that people would believe that he was who he was and that they would ultimately have what he said they would have. He didn't heal people just to be healing. He didn't raise the dead just to be raising the dead. In fact, you can see moments of it because remember when he raised Lazarus, the scriptures tell us that there were countless people who came to believe because of that. You don't think that was a part of Jesus' thinking? 
See, whenever Jesus would move in such a way and you would see miraculous things, the point of that is to capture somebody's mind and recognizing the Messiah, recognizing that he was the son of the living God so that ultimately their souls could be saved. So the church today, we don't exist to have these gifts and to utilize them just so that we can say we have them. I'm a man of God. <laughs> but they exist so that we can save souls. You don't think that if the Lord gave you a word about somebody at your job, where he gave you information you shouldn't have, you don't think if you went to them and said, let me tell you what God said, and then you started speaking to their life in a way that made it seem like you were creeping out their closet door? You don't think if you shared some information like that and then put behind that, now you need to repent. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God that died for your sins. Ask Him to come into your life. You don't think that person would inch a little bit closer than they ever have in their life? Isn't that what the woman at the well did? Right? Jesus started telling her business to her. She goes back to the Samaritans, and this is, this is, these are her exact words. Come see the man who told me everything I did in my life. And the town began to walk out. They wanted to see who is this man who can tell things about people's lives that he doesn't even know. Jesus sees them coming. His disciples say, Jesus, can we get some food? And Jesus said, I have food that you know not of. My food is to do the will of my Father as he sees all these people come. Then he says, pray to the God of the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. As he sees these people coming because their souls need to be saved. This is a room full of people who have the Spirit of God inside of them. Just think about this. For those of you who are in this room and those of you who are watching right now, just think about this. Imagine if every one of you under the sound of my voice right now went tomorrow and shared the gospel with somebody that by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within you. Every one of us. Do you think we could get one? Could we get two? Could we get ten? What if we did that every week? What if we did that every single week? What could we do? How many souls would be saved? As we sit in churches and just relish in our worship and our personal God who just makes us comfortable in our spiritual family in the four walls that we have as we talk about this God together and even talk about how the stuff we, we see in Greek and Hebrew and talk about these words and what they mean to us. Meanwhile, the people outside of us are dying spiritually. The world right now is on the brink of something that could be serious. <laughs> if this nation were to melt away today, there would, people who, there would be people who would experience two fires. One before death and one right after. <sighs> Beloved, you have a power inside of you. And that power strengthens you to live in victory, but it also strengthens you to share the gospel. There is nothing in the New Testament scriptures more important than the gospel itself. And we have been empowered to be able to share it. We've got to get ready to share it. Some of you who have been with me long enough know that I, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, am actually priming you for something. You guys know that this year our objective is the reward of this suffering. And in the next few weeks, I'm going to talk to you about kind of the next phase of where we go in regard to that objective. I hope that some of you have been taking the thank you cards. I hope that you've been giving them out as you go out to places to eat or if you receive any services. If you go to the dog groomer, leave one for the dog groomer. Just tell them you appreciate them. Tell them they've done a great job. But grab some of those cards. We'll ensure that we have more 
but we want to show people the love of Christ, but we're about to go to another level in a couple of weeks. I can't wait to share it with you. I just can't do it right now. But I want you to be in prayer um, because people's lives hang in the balance and God has given us a responsibility, a commission to help people so that their lives can be eternal with God as he desires them to be. Bow your heads with me. Eternal Father in heaven, we hear what you're saying to us. We see, Father, as you have ministered to our spiritual family here that you really are guiding us and you are teaching us and preparing us. I pray, Father, that this word, Lord God, would truly sink down into the hearts of people, the hearts of your people, that, God, we would all begin to have a deeper understanding and keep at the top of our minds the fact that we are unified with Christ, the fact that we are participants with Christ living in us and that we have a power on the inside of us to even help us proclaim your gospel. And so, Father, I pray that you would just churn in each person under the sound of my voice, whether they are watching online or whether they are in this room. I pray that you would just churn this message. I pray that you would churn the great commission on the inside of us. I pray that it would begin to burn and fuel our thinking. And that we would truly walk in faith in moments we have the opportunity to share the gospel with people who are lost. And that, Lord, ultimately you would receive the glory and that Jesus would receive the reward of his suffering. And so, God, we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for every breath that we have every single day. We thank you for every new day where we wake up and your mercies are new. And we pray, God, that we will be used in that day for whatever you desire to use us for. That indeed we would recognize that we no longer live but Christ lives by faith in and through us. So, Father, we honor you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.